driving down the street and someone cuts you off. You, can, you have a few ways of seeing it. This person cut you off. How dare they cut you off? And you could take it very personally. What the hell is wrong with you? You start yelling at the person, get angry about it. Or you could see it for what it probably really is. The person didn't cut you off. They didn't sit there and go, oh, here's Scanlon driving down the street. Let me cut Scanlon off. No, it's a person who either they didn't see you, so they made a mistake. You can get angry at people for making mistakes. Like, you've never made a mistake before. Um, and by the way, I find that people who road rage are typically, at least my experience, are typically the people who are the most forgiving of themselves when they, get, you know, when they, when they do something like that in traffic. Somebody else, someone cuts them off, and they're just screaming, yelling, oh, what the hell's wrong? You're so stupid. I hate people. are so dumb. And then when they cut somebody else off, they're like, oh, my bad. <laughs> or worse yet, the person starts honking at them, and, they, and, they, and then they get combated with the person who's honking at them. It's the exact same thing you do. You rage at them, you honk at people, and then someone honks at you, and all of a sudden, you feel like it's a, it's a personal conflict. I mean, can you not see, like, oh, I made a mistake when I cut this person off. They're honking at me. They're pissed at me. Wow, that's the same kind of thing I do when I get angry with someone. Yeah, I... And so if, you're, if you can think about it ahead of time, that's why so much of this is, is important to do ahead of time. So that when you're, when you're in the moment, you can stop and, you know, when, you, when, when someone cuts you off, you can stop and say to yourself, I was just thinking about this yesterday. That person's not cutting me off. They made a mistake. They didn't see me. Or maybe they're having a bad day. So maybe they did mean to cut me off, but this, it's just because they're angry. And what, it ha what has it really done? It slowed me down five seconds. And am I really going to allow this person who cut me off and slowed me down by five seconds to ruin the whole rest of my day? Now that person is going to have a tremendous influence over me, and that person now has taken more control over my emotions and my thinking than I have. If you're walking down the street and someone bails out of a van, grabs you, cuffs you, throws you in the van, and then, and then you know, flies you someplace else in the world and you become a slave, you'd be pissed off if they took control of your body this way. And yet we very easily hand over control of our minds and our hearts to people who just cut us off in traffic or say something that we think was probably insulting. And that, you know, again, has a, has a tremendous influence over how we live. So it's not just taking control of our, of our body, which it does do that too, because it takes control of our thinking and our feelings, which controls how we behave. And of course, now that's going to influence how you behave in the rest, you know, throughout the rest of the day. Maybe now that puts you in a bad mood, and so now you interact with the person at McDonald's, and now you're rude to them, and then they're rude to somebody else, and they hate their job now, and they have all these other problems going on, and we're just continuously in this cycle, making the world a worse place. Why? Because someone cut us off, and we took it personally. Instead, if we can shape our thinking and say, it's not personal. It's like I, I look at teachers who burn out, and I, I see why they do it. It's because they take everything so personally. I don't know that any of you walk in here and say, um, yeah, I'm going to ignore a scan. I don't think yeah, there's nothing useful there. I, I know what I need to know later in my life. I don't think it's that at all. I don't think it's anything personal. I mean, by the way, you're not ignoring me. You're, you're ignoring Epictetus, and I guess maybe someday, if there's an afterlife, you can meet him, explain to him why you ignored him. But there is something interesting that, that literally millions of people since 135 have found tremendous value in what he offers. And I'm not talking about just like your neighbor. I'm talking about like business leaders. Like, He's a, again, Stoic philosopher. He's one of the, he's, next to Marcus Aurelius, he's the best known Stoic philosopher. He actually intentionally wrote a manual, How to Live Stoically. I mean, I, you're not going to find a business leader, I mean like a genuine business leader, who hasn't read Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus and Seneca. Because Stoicism translates so well into business and success in life. And you have to take my word for it, take the word of the people who actually do do that. It's like, uh, uh, like Machiavelli, many of you have read Machiavelli. Um, it's funny, like, I mentioned him, and people, you know, will, will kind of ignore it, but as soon as I mentioned, like, Tupac called himself Machiavelli. He went to prison, and, and he read Machiavelli. And when he got out, he started calling himself Machiavelli. It was a, and he made a, you know, made a CD, a, a record on it. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, wait, Tupac did it, huh? It's like, fine, but millions, and if that's what gets you, that's fine, but millions of people throughout history, I mean, again, it's another thing, that right next to Marcus Aurelius, you've got Machiavelli who gives you advice about how it is that a person can come into power and stay in power. And not just moral, he's not interested in morals and ethics, he's interested in maintaining power, that's it. He's not interested in right or wrong. Because he argues that when you're a leader, there's somebody who has to operate beyond good and evil because you're responsible for the people underneath you. A business leader has to be cutthroat and a business leader has to be immoral. A business leader has to do all this because you've got tens of thousands of people who work for you 
and you're responsible for them. If you make a bad business decision, the company goes out of business, all those people lose their jobs and pensions. So therefore, your, your, your obligation is bigger than yourself. This is what Machiavelli teaches. And you can, and I was, like, I was, um, if any of you have ever heard of, um, uh, what's his name, Michael Francis, he's a former mobster. Um, he was essentially the richest mobster um, going back to the 70s and 80s. The guy was making $10 million a week in this gas fraud thing. It's interesting. But anyway, he went to prison for 20, I think 23 years, and now he's out and he has a YouTube channel and he gives business advice, and he talks about that. He says that when you're in the Italian mafia, everybody has to read Machiavelli's The Prince. He says it's required reading. Not just like, hey, you should. They require you to do it. That's interesting. A group of criminals who have to read a certain book. And the book's not long. It's a pretty short little you know, book. But that's my point is that I don't think anybody walks in here and knowing, if, if you knew what you, if you knew what, if you knew what you could know about Machiavelli, it'd probably be a good chance you'd read it because you'd see how all these successful people have read it and applied it. The same is true about Epictetus. But the fact of the matter is that like most things in life, the things that damage us are the things we don't know what we don't know. We don't know, like if I ask you, what are you going to have to know in 10 years? You have no idea. And, you, and, and even better than I know what you're going to have to know in 10 years. But I don't think anybody who comes in here, and if you knew what you needed to know in 10 years, would still behave the way that we behave. And that's true about a lot of things. It's not just school. You know, it's about how we treat people. It's how we treat, especially God, how we treat ourselves. Now, I wonder how many of you, like, when you look at the things that you're eating and you fast forward in your life, if you can see and go, holy crap, I wish I knew then what I know now. You know, you should eat stuff that comes out of a cellophane bag for the most part. Yeah. Probably about as well as I know that I shouldn't be guzzling three or four of these Diet Cokes every single day. This is true. They're healthy. Yeah. But if we, if we get this thing of like, ah, but what do you know? You drink all this Diet Coke. That's true. And what do you know? You eat all the stuff that comes out of cellophane bags. We all don't. We all make these kinds of things. But the question isn't what somebody else does. The question is what are you doing? But what is it that, that you're doing that's shaping your life for the future? I mentioned before, I'll go back to it again. I don't know how many of you guys want to have families, kids, spouses in, you know, in the years to come. Whatever you're doing right now is preparing the life that you're going to be living when you bring children into the world. So the question is going to be, what kind of a world, what kind of a family do you want to bring your children into? I was talking with somebody recently, a former student, who was having these problems with uh, his girlfriend. It's a long story, but he was telling me that every time he, like, he, he, had, he had an argument with his, he was telling me that he, he had an argument with his girlfriend in the morning, and by the afternoon he was telling her basically, you know, giving her an ultimatum, you need to either trust me or we need to just break up. And I'm like, dude, it's been six hours. <laughs> You know, something happened that shook her, her, her faith in him. He didn't, you know, he didn't cheat. He screwed up. You know, he messed up. He was essentially talking to someone. He shouldn't have been talking to her the way he was talking to her. And, you know, and then suddenly within six hours, and he was, like, nervous. When he was, like, when he was talking to me, he was, like, almost visibly shaking. What do you suppose is the real issue going on there? Why does he want an answer right now? He hates the uncertainty. He hates being out there in the breach, not knowing one way or the other, and not being in control. He's a person who has to perpetually be in control. Now, as I was talking with him, I asked him, what do you suppose your chances are for being in a relationship now where you can work out problems with your significant other? Or does it have to just be your way or no other way? And he's, and he's realizing this. And, then, and it was interesting because he came to me telling me he was realizing this, that he gave her this ultimatum within a few hours, and I wasn't telling him anything that he, hadn't, that he, was, that he wasn't already kind of considering from other conversations that we had had over the past couple of years. And so what it was, was what was shaping, the, was, he's looking at this one particular relationship and he's saying essentially that, he had, that he's seeing it as a training ground. It's a, it's, it's a practice. He's already learned something about himself. He can't talk to other people without, flirt, without being flirty. And the thing is, like he was saying, he looked at the messages afterwards and was like, holy crap, I said that. <laughs> And, oh my gosh, yeah, that looks bad. And you realize it afterwards. At the time, you might know, like, nah, I probably shouldn't say that. But then afterwards, when you look at, like, the slew of them, you're like, oh, wow, that looks really bad. You know? Even just, like, giving someone a compliment so they feel good about themselves. Not that he necessarily was into this person, but just gave them a compliment because, it, you know, it, it would brighten their day. And, he, and then <laughs> he told me his girlfriend was sitting there, like, crossed arms. It was just like, so you did this to be, uh, to be altruistic, to make, to, uh, not for yourself, but to make them feel good. 
And it sounds stupid in retrospect, but I wonder how many of you have done that, given a compliment to someone just so they would feel better about themselves. But afterwards, when she's presenting it this way, of course, it sounds like the most outlandish, impossible thing in the world. You know? And so, it's the mindset with which we approach things. And so he was saying that he sees this, this break, this, this, this huge problem with his girlfriend, from this perspective of, well, even if I can't salvage this, at least I can learn from it, so I can not be that person in the future. But he's trying to work things out with her because he wants to be able to be a person who can work out problems with somebody. And he said that in his life he has seen this pattern of behavior in his life where he has just fled away from, from these problems. And of course, if you're constantly fleeing problems, then you're never going to be able to, to, to build anything. It's just like if, you have a, if, if you're the kind of person who goes to work, and every time you, get, uh, you have a bad day at work, you're just like, oh, screw this, I quit. Well, then you're always going to be starting at new companies, and you're, all, and you're never going to be able to move up in anything. You're never going to be able to build a career, because you're always having to start from the ground floor. I have a good friend of mine who, who does this all the time. He's, I, gosh dang it, I mean, I'm not joking. I must, be, I must help him with resumes three, times, three or four times a year. He always comes over and I help him with his resumes because he finds a job that's going to pay him 25 cents an hour more, a job that's going to pay him 40 cents an hour more. And so he's always looking at like, just like chipping away to try to raise his income, but he never gets an opportunity to move up in any company. That stops him from being able to build something real. If you're a person who's going to have problems with significant others and just blow it off and be like, screw this, I don't need to deal with this. I'm, you know, and like, like he was saying, like, you know, he's young, he's, like, I think he's 21. And he's like, I know people, like, all of his friends are telling him, ah, oh, you're young, quit taking things so seriously. But he realizes that if he starts taking things seriously at 21, in fact, he, he was telling me, if I took things more seriously at 18, I would be three years ahead of where I am right now. And if I don't start taking things seriously until I'm 25, I'm going to be four years behind where I am right now, which is seven years behind when I could have started taking things more seriously. Think about what you could accomplish in seven years. And I mean that. Think about it. Because you couldn't possibly conceive it because we never have done that. And what I'm saying is that what you could accomplish in seven years is so far beyond what you could possibly imagine right now. And, and that's what makes it hard, though, for us to do it. Because we can't imagine it. And so we don't, pos we, we don't pursue what possibly could be. We only pursue the thing that we have right here in front of us because it seems real, it's tangible. Somebody cuts you off, that anger is so real and tangible, it's right in front of you. What's not in front of you is, this, is the ability to step back from it and, and ask yourself a larger question about humanity. This person's having a bad day, obviously. They cut me off, I feel for this person. I wonder how many of you have ever had someone like angry with you, I mean like genuinely angry with you, and, you haven't really done anything against him, and then it's so easy to just be so pissed off at this person who's coming at you so hard, but it's so difficult to sit back and just go, my God, this person's having such a bad day that they're coming at me like this, and I haven't even done anything. And I don't mean like in the patronizing, I want to pray for you kind of way. I mean like you seriously sit there and just be like, this sucks. You know, I had a student one time who, he wasn't with me for, he was only with me for a few, for a few days. I have no idea what ever happened to this person. He was just came in and was just so like angry, he walked up to my desk and, and just was just a complete, you know, shit from, from the from the very second he walked in. And I knew he was coming. I knew he was a problem. He got kicked out of another school and then he got kicked out of another class and whenever that happens, they always have the same answer. Hey, give him the Scanlon. That would be a good idea. <laughs> and so uh, he was only in my class, and this guy was so angry. And I looked up at, at just at his, the few things I could look up on, on his records and I just sat there and said, this sucks, man, this dude's angry. And he's got a reason to be. I can look at it and I can see why he's so pissed off. And he, it wasn't even, it wasn't his fault what he was feeling. And he didn't have the skill set to use what he was thinking to shape how he was feeling. And he could have looked at it, like I was just talking to another friend of mine last night, who was married for 25 years and his, and his wife died. And he was telling me that like, they had these problems while they were in their relationship and they split up for a year because of some stuff that had gone down between them. And then they finally you know, worked it out and they reconciled and they got together and then that's when he found out that, that she was sick. And when he got, you know, she, like, he said, like a few months later, they found out she was sick and she survived for a few years and then she died. And it's, it's just like this guy that you talk to and he's, this is a street dude, man. I don't think he ever even graduated from high school. He's a street dude, man. He was telling me a story about how like, she went to a church because, you know, to, to get away from him. So he went down to the church strapped and they had to like lock the doors and call the police because he was down there to kill somebody because he was trying to, you know, because he wanted to get her back. This guy's 
you know, but he's, he's reformed. He's, he's a different person today than he was back then. And to hear this person talk about that and just say, like, yeah, that was a whole year or so that they were apart. He said, he said it was a year or two. So it was a whole year or two that they were apart that it was completely wasted, that they could never get back. You know? He had to shape his thinking so that he would change his behavior. And he was telling me that the way he turned his life around, he was just, and, and he was just like almost hostile about it. He's like, I didn't need no God. I didn't need no this. I didn't know families. I had to grab myself and pick myself up and do this. It was his thinking that helped to shape his feelings. The problem can become when we use our feelings to shape our thinking. Not that you shouldn't feel. Of course you should feel. Things like, like sympathy and love and empathy, caring about other people, a desire for justice, all of that comes from here. That does not come from here. Self-serving, selfishness, that comes from here. It makes sense, evolutionarily, to care only about yourself above everybody else. But all of those things that we value as human beings, and the things that we value in human beings, comes from here. And so, you know, when we say, like, yo, we have to cut out all of our feelings, bullshit. No, you shouldn't. That, 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 that severs you in half. That cuts you in half. You're only now half of a person. You're not a full human being. Are you a thinker or are you a feeler? Yes, you should be both. Because both of those things are, are, are part of what it is to, to be a human. Like I said, desires for justice and love and empathy and sympathy, wanting to make the world a better place, all of that is here. Now, how do we do it? That comes from here. Here's what it is to be a good person. How do I now shape myself to become a good person? Despite the feelings and the pulls of these things. Forgiveness. Uh, I don't know, man. Is there a desire to forgive people? That oftentimes comes from here. And by the way, a really hard thing is to be able to accept forgiveness. That can get in the way of it as well. Have you ever done something bad and someone forgives you? And you have a hell of a time accepting their forgiveness because you just don't know if you can trust them because, you, because what you did was so bad it doesn't deserve to be forgiven. And then you go through life and you're just like waiting for the other foot to drop and you just can't accept somebody else's forgiveness. But you can forgive somebody else and you absolutely know that they can trust the fact that you're forgiving them. <laughs> but then maybe they can't feel that. And that's what severs relationships. It isn't even so much betrayal or, or, or you know, um, you know, dishonesty that destroys relationships. It's not being able to accept forgiveness, just as much as not being able to give it. It's a hard thing, man. It's a hard thing. And so it's not just the it's not just the things that disturb us, but but, but the views that we take of it. What I've done is so bad I can't be forgiven. But they love you. And they're going to figure out a way to forgive you. I don't know, man. I don't feel like I deserve it. Do you deserve it? Probably not. But you probably don't deserve food and water either. <laughs> There's a lot of things that we don't deserve in life, man. But isn't it great when you get them? And maybe when you get them, maybe you can internalize it, appreciate it, and be the person that they want, that they see in you. The person that you know you could be, man. Just balance these things out. Questions? Comments? Concerns? Complaints? Criticisms? Critiques? Happy Wednesday! <laughs>